All right, welcome everyone to day two of Metal Investor Forum. This is David Morgan. I think most of you know that. So let's get into this. I'm talking about silver mostly, but also current events. So thank you again, Metals Investors Forum, uh, Scott Gibson, Matt Bennett, and everybody behind the camera. There's a lot that goes into these and they've been doing an outstanding job. And I really feel uh, very happy to be able to participate. So there is the normal disclosure. Disclosure: I'm going to be making some forward-looking statements. They are best on the best available information. Things do change in life, so pay attention, but don't hang your hat on anything I say. So today's lecture is called "Is Silver an Asymmetric Trade?" And of course, as you all know, what does asymmetric means? And that's when the downside is limited, and the upside is unlimited. Now, I'll caution everybody here, the upside in silver is probably not unlimited, especially under the conditions that we have where the derivatives markets in the commodities have basically managed prices for decades. It's not only true in silver where it's more obvious and more talked about, but it's true in the grains, it's true in lumber, it's true in soybean oil. All these things are interconnected <clears throat> because they're all done in a leveraged manner. And since you, if you have more money than somebody else at a poker table, the odds of you winning are greatly improved if you have like 10 times the cash the other person has, because all you do is wait for a good hand, throw that in. They have to call you, met, you know, meet your demand for how much goes in the, pool, in the table, call, bang, you win, that's it. It's kind of a good analogy for the way the future markets work, because the banks have unlimited funds, and the trading funds that are on the opposite side most of the time do not, they're limited. So once they're out of the ability to buy and the banks start to sell, there's a lot of selling pressure and there's not much that can be done about it. Doesn't mean that the solar market isn't gonna make a big move, it will. The only way it will do so though, is when the physical market overcomes the derivatives market. And that's actually taking place as we speak. So I've shown this, Several times I'm doing it again. Obviously, this came out in Forbes magazine right after Warren Buffett bought. And just a few things to point out on this chart. First of all, it goes from 1344. So we're talking about, you know, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. And in that time frame, if you go back to 1344, where this chart begins, you're looking at an inflation-adjusted dollar. So this was done in 1998. But the way this chart was uh, constructed, a dollar in 1344 is the same dollar as in 1998. So the inflation lie has been taken out of this chart. So we're actually looking at an accurate cost or price of silver for those few thousand years. So. Going back, 1344, we had $400 silver. The all-time high was $800 silver in 1477, about 100 years later. Dropped down gradually over several hundred years to reach around $200. Again, these are $1998, so you would have to up that a little bit now because of the inflation that's taken place over the last 25 years. We get to... Uh, in the mid 1700s or so, drops again to around 70, 80. And silver was really demonetized in 1873 uh, officially. And then it kind of came back into the monetary system. But since it was demonetized <clears throat> as a money metal and gold only was used as a standard in 1873, we did have circulating silver coins. And Point being is that there wasn't as much emphasis by the bankers to hold silver as there was previous to this. So the most important takeaway that we can look at on this chart, and I'll finish it, is that when gold and silver both perform the same function, which is money, I mean, we weren't in a high-tech world in 1873. There was a ratio, gold silver ratio, that never got above 20. So in these you know, a few thousand years, what we saw was, you know, you go to 2000 BC to, you know, today, what you saw was a gold silver ratio of 20 or lower, both function as money, and that was pretty close to the natural ratio. 
It's only after silver was demonetized that you saw these ratios go to 100 to 1, 125 to 1. Silver is only an industrial commodity, and on it goes. So as we can see from this chart, we've got an all-time inflation-adjusted low at uh, 1992 at 473. And that's when Warren Buffett bought. He was buying not in one day. He accumulated over time, but he accumulated right here at the bottom. As most of you know, Warren Buffett purportedly sold his silver position about $9. But what's interesting about the sell is, first of all, he sent his silver to London. The amount of silver he bought was 130 million ounces. The SLV was started in London with 130 million ounces. So you can draw your own conclusions from that coincidence, but uh, whether or not that silver is actually sold or used in another manner, I do not know. So of all the metals, you can look here on this chart, I won't read them off. Silver is the only one that is not above its all time high. And even if you take silver to 1980, 1980, not the one day high of 50, but the average price for the entire year was $20 back in 1980. So inflation adjusts that. So even at $20, we're just barely above that now, <clears throat> so many years later, 50 years later, whatever it's been. Silver's price performance in this new bull market, as you can see from uh, early 2002, we had a nice run to the 08 financial crisis, about almost a 400% gain, so four times on your money over those <clears throat> years. And then we had the financial crisis that dropped both gold and silver, it dropped silver more than gold, but they both fell sharply and rebounded just as sharply. And I believe that's a good setup for where we're at now. I am expecting some type of hard pullback in the financial markets when, I don't know, I think it'll be this year, could be stocks, probably it'll be stocks and bonds, could be a money center bank failing, it could be a transition I'll get into later in this lecture. But uh, so if you are able to buy here, and I was lucky and did, um, then you got a 400% gain up to 2011. Yes, I did call the top and, you know, 2020 hindsight, I wish I would have gotten out of all my positions. I did not. I did take some pretty healthy profits. Some people did drop off my service and retired. But um, nonetheless, I do expect to see a good year this year. And I think if I'm right, there's three legs up in these markets. So if you count it the way I'm showing it here, you had one from 2002 to 2008, another one from 2009 to 2011. And let's say for talking purposes, we have another one from 2023 uh, to 2025. The reason I said 2025 is the this is leg one, which gives you good gains. Leg two gives you better gains, although they're about the same. You see, it's a lot shorter in time. And the last leg up is usually twice as good as the previous leg, which means two. So it'd be plus 800%. And it's in a very short uh, timeline, very short, usually year, two years, that type of thing. So silver demand, I think we all know this, industrial demand's over half the market. Jewelry remains steady. Photography is a, a nowhere. Silverware is a small slice, continues. And physical investment, uh, this last few years have been rather significant. Uh, if you go back a decade or so, you might see 10% of the market was in physical investment. So certainly with, with the ETFs, and with the awareness of silver throughout the world now, you see a lot more physical investment. This is from the Silver Institute and BMO, basically a projection, forward-looking statement, use caution, but it shows you from present day, 2023 till 2030, so the next, let's say, seven years or so, the deficit is projected to grow and grow and grow. Now, what's interesting about this chart is that if you go down here to 2029, 2030, it shows a 200 million ounce deficit. Except what we all know, uh, you may not in this lecture, but the silver bugs know, is that the Silver Institute said there was a 200 million ounce deficit in 2022. 
So we've already seen this maximum projection occur last year where it was forecast to be, I'm going to wag it, 25 million ounces deficit. No, nope. almost, almost 200 million ounces. So where my cursor is way down here. Does that mean we're going to go from 200 and follow this projection down? And the answer is, I do not know, but I actually think it could. In other words, 2023 could be 200 million, 2024 could be 215 million, and on it goes. These are projections, but it is very noteworthy that silver was in a deficit from 1990 to 2005 inclusive. And then we started building inventories up until the last couple of years, and now we're back in a deficit situation. So mine supply isn't going to save us, at least not for a few years. If you look here at um, incrementums, and this is, this is basically a chart from the Silver Institute, but regardless, what you see from about 2013 till present day, projected out a couple of years, is we're kind of flatlined at about 850 million ounces, and it could go higher. There's projections that will go higher. Well, we're talking about a couple percent, and yes, that's more than a couple percent of a big number, a big number, but we're not going to see anything significant over the next few years. This is the silver demand high use case, and what's important here to note is the graphics here. So if you look at this red line that's dotted at the top, it shows mined silver, so the 850 I just showed you, plus recycled silver, which is about 150 million ounces a year. And according to Matt Watson, who made this chart, it flatlines. I tend to agree with that. I would say, you know, more conservatively, perhaps, it might go up from left to right, but very slightly. The point of this chart is, it's starting at about, 20, about now, we are, everything that we mine and recycle barely meets the demand. But I just told you a minute ago that it didn't meet the demand in 2022. We had a 200 million ounce deficit. So you might shift this chart up. Point is that at some point, more or less now, going forward, you cannot do everything that you want with silver. There's just not enough silver. You can't take on all the automotive, all the power, photography is basically nothing, solar, which is about 10% of the market, and continuing to grow and meet demand. So if you are a long-term oriented or you want a legacy investment for your family, you might consider silver as a, as a long-term play, although I think we are going to get that spike high between 2024 and 2025. I don't want to, you know, talk out of both sides of my mouth. What I'm suggesting here is if I'm wrong, which is possible, but you've got patience or you will it to your grandkids or whatever, um, it's almost a no-lose bet. This is something I like to talk about. And then, of course, whenever you pick the starting and finish line, you can make whatever you want look better because you get to cherry pick. But if we start in 2000 when the gold bull market started, both silver and gold actually outperformed the Dow Jones and the S&P 500. Because all you ever hear about in the States anyway is that, you know, you just buy and hold stocks, buy an index fund, buy the ETF for the S&P 500, and you're good to go. Well, in some ways you are, but you know, I could make the same argument with gold and silver back here, and this chart tells the truth. So, do you need both? Yeah, but there's times, as Mike Maloney's pointed out, where you really want to be in one, maybe not in one asset class, but you want to weight it differently. When stocks are on a run, you want to be underweight gold. And when stocks are on a decline, you want to be overweight gold, or I should say precious metals. So now just the fundamentals we all know, but worth a review, the GDP ratio, U.S. debt to GDP. What I've circled in red is, you know, during the last major bull market from 70 to 80, you see that we had really relatively strong fiscal policy. We weren't really printing money like mad, mad men and, you know, things were actually pretty stable, even though we had in the 1979 very high inflation 
relative to the percent of GDP versus the debt, it was very reasonable. And we got things under control, we, the U.S. Uh, and then, of course, things started inflating it again, you know, about the tech wreck in 2000. But up until 2010 or so, after the 2008 financial crisis, the Fed really let the money supply go, go, go. And over in the last, since 2020 in the illness, it basically went vertical. I mean, that's parabolic. Any parabolic chart, I don't care if it's soybean oil, the debt to GDP ratio, silver price, cattle futures, I don't care. When it goes parabolic, they don't last that long. And that's a place where you want to be very careful uh, what you're doing or stay out of the market. So in this chart, you can see here at the very end, we started to taper and cut back and increase interest rates, but that is a very small amount of change. Yes, it's going the, I'll call it correct direction to get tighter fiscal policy, but it won't do much if you look at that curve, unless it continues, which I think the Fed will continue, but not to a level that it's gonna make a huge difference. So the velocity of money is key. It doesn't matter how much you print, it does, but it doesn't matter how much you print until it gets into circulation. And it hasn't been much in circulation, but it's starting to pick up and it will accelerate. Silver's undervalued relative to the stock market. Silver is undervalued relative to the real estate market. The amount of gold and silver, but I'll just talk gold, that's what this chart says, is all of investment holdings. You look at what's going on in mutual funds, pension funds, investment banks, et cetera. You know, 1.1% is pretty small. So if that just doubled to 2% move into gold, it would certainly have an effect on price and a significant one. I'm on my Twitter page. It's called at SilverGuru22. You can see I've got a check mark now at Silver Guru 22 suggest you get on there, just showing you, I just posted this this morning. It has to do with the gold standard Dow. If you don't know what a Dow is, look it up. I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going a little quickly, but it's a way to get, let's say, yield on your gold. I would use it as a tool, not the sole investment in gold, but it's something to consider. Uh, I just posted this one. I really think, and I don't talk about geopolitics much. I don't like, I'm equally disturbed by both party systems. Anyway, enough of my libertarianism. I think Biden's on the way out. I think that uh, within the next couple of months, you'll see the 25th Amendment come into play and that Joe Biden is mentally incompetent to hold down the presidency. There's a lot of news mainstream news that aren't backing them anymore. They're starting to put out negative things. This is from my main site, themorganreport.com. If you hit the blog, uh, pull down and hit blog. If you type in crypto conspiracy over here in this right-hand box, which I've already typed it in just for display purposes, you'll see 29 episodes. I certainly wouldn't say listen to every one, but you would want to listen to the first three and maybe 14 where I talked to Kurt Wukert on what's going on primarily with Bitcoin, but the cryptos in general. And then this is one that I've talked about again and again. It's on the landing page. And all you click to is the, the landing page. There's a yellow bar. Click that. You'll see this. It's my interview with Stansbury Research, and it's got 2 million views. There's a reason for that. Banks to seize your money in the coming financial crisis. It's all about the coming bail-ins. So markets move in a rather um, interesting manner. Real estate, tech stocks, fang stocks, they all get an acceleration at the end of the move. And silver, 90% of the move in the last 10% of the time. Well, actually, it was uh, 42 months. Uh, excuse me, 87% uh, of the move happened in the last 7% of the time. And we had an 800% gain in one year. I'm looking for something similar this time around. Streaming companies are what we favor in the Morgan Report. This shows you Franco Nevada. If you bought Franco at the same time, gold peaked at 2000. Franco was at 50, now it's at 150. So you would have tripled your gold investment and collected dividends along the way. So let me just finish by saying, I'm sure there's questions. So you can reach me at 
silverguru1 at silver-investor.com. I know it's a long address. It's for my consulting clients only. I want to make it available for MIF. In the subject line, put in MIF, silverguru in the numeral one, at silver-investor.com. Thank you very much.